studio do oops hello we're being recorded welcome everybody <laughs> so uh i picked this one up at the studio ghibli museum uh often looking at inspirations from things like S studio ghibli is lovely but try to pick out an aspect versus doing direct copies for some things and when you're thinking about aspects think of things like color ranges or framing on things books like these where you get the behind the scenes storyboarding are lovely for inspiration because it's not finished images and get a little closer so you can see how they do their framing of course all in japanese i only know so much so i got that for the images facial expressions <laughs> if you are an artist and you are trying to look at facial expressions trying to come up with facial expressions out of thin air is often going to be rather difficult and won't feel true to life if you don't reference things an artist who does a lot of referencing so i'm not going to copy and paste names and titles into the chat that would be ridiculous you guys are all welcome to join me over in discord and i will give you a whole list of books i'd re like to reference so james gurney if you look him up on youtube he actually has a video on how he does all of his stuff on uh ooh, what was it i think it was na australian or canadian stamps was was basically what he was uh showing a film on but basically what he ends up doing for all of his paintings is he makes his own references which is a little bit hard when you're doing things like dinosaurs because you know you can't go out and photograph real life dinosaurs at least not for the moment so what he does is he goes out into real life and he will photograph references of locations he enjoys and he makes his models and then photographs those and uses those as his reference for his oil paintings which is part of the reason why he's got such absolutely gorgeous luminous things and he handles his light oh so gorgeously so drawn to life highly recommend this series uh the 20 years of disney master classics so if you want an idea of how to use references well highly recommend basically all of the disney materials because they especially in the golden age were very good at using reference and on that note, ooh, the nine old men. So, as for instance, a lot of these guys were lucky enough that they actually got to have their animals brought into studio. So they would have deer and lions, etc., etc., in. So that way they could see the animals in real life and see how they moved. And they also did things like had mirrors right next to them so that way they could practice their facial expressions and make them as realistic as possible. A lot of these books are fairly expensive and also who in the world can get to a bookstore nowadays, but libraries, more and more libraries now are going digital and you should be able to order your books online. Oof. Ugh. <laughs> Ah, and be able to check some stuff out without uh, having to go to leave your house. And that's awesome. Some of my art, because it's a lot easier to show than tell. <laughs> when I'm doing stuff with references, so for instance, our Shishi here. So Shishi uh, is a type of guardian lion. You often, often see them uh, outside of temples and uh, you have different versions in China, in Korea, in Japan. And I have seen a lot of these in person. In fact, I've got a couple little ones from Japan. They are my friends here. I actually stick by my desk and keep me company and safe. <laughs> uh, I, when I was drawing and painting these critters, I went back to the literary version and went, aha, she, she, uh, lion versus dog. So I went lion, uh, base. And then I went, you know what? I want something a little bit playful. 
since they often have a ball sitting next to them, okay, let's find some cute pictures of kittens and try to put a lion in a kitten body and make them having fun. For my ugh, transgender pride flag, Phoenix, I went for a flamingo because I adore flamingos and they're incredibly klutzy and weird, but you know what? Sometimes when you're transgender, that's part of the process as you go through your klutzy weird phase. I'm sure everybody's seen this one over in Discord at this point. So this guy is a watercolor painting of my two corgis. And of course, I have them here. I have them as a reference in order to get an idea of what I'm doing. Oh, and then one of my D&D characters, because why not? <laughs> So, while I'm showing off these guys and some stuff is coming into Q&A, what I want you guys to do is to think up a challenge for me. And the challenge is going to be, I want you to think up an animal. Let's start with a real animal. <laughs> it could be a dead animal. I'm, I'm okay with something having uh, been extinct for a while. But challenge me to come up with an animal that I draw from memory. And the reason why I want you to do that is that I want to show you how even an artist who does a lot of animal studies uh, has a really hard time remembering exactly what an animal looks like. And I'm going to give my honest try, and then I'll pull up a reference, and I'll do it again, but with an animal there. So, again, you guys come up with a couple animals for me. And We've got a lot coming in. We've got bearded vulture, dodo bird, jackalope, Whoa. jackalope platypus. That might be one. Um, a bat, a sandhill crane, bilby, I, I don't know what bilby is, kangaroo, multiple times, uh, <laughs> lynx, tiger, and wombat so far. So I'm going to avoid a couple of those because I have those right here. And that freshly <laughs> reminds me of what these are. Uh, so this series was uh, my boo series, is in caribou, uh, but instead of uh, a, a traditional evergreen leaf uh, wreath. I went for a eucalyptus wreath instead and went for Australian animals. Wallabies, moose, woolly rhinos. Um, uh, the jackalope platypus was in reference to the picture which we've already come to. Yes. <laughs> and uh, someone would like to know what you had for breakfast. Um, I've got a mixture of a fruit juice and a tea and I've got another tea here, and this one I think is constant comment. It is. It just needs to finish cooling enough that I can drink it. Yeah. A uh, goblin shark. Goblin. Oh. And uh, if you get a chance, could you put a list of good reference books into the chat at some point? So because the chat is going to disappear, what I'm going to do is say everybody head over to Discord afterwards, and I will very happily share some of my favorite references with you guys. All. Sorry. Folks, there we go. Hmm. <laughs> All right, let's give it a try. So I'm going to go straight to Sharpie because we did a quick test and I think the Sharpie should be showing up. If it doesn't, let me know. We'll figure out something. Let's see. Let's try... Mm. What do you think, Morgan? I want you to try. Tell me what to do in instead of me deciding, because then, <laughs> then it's it's definitely a challenge for me. Um, let's see. Let's do the bat. Bat it is. All right, so while I start drawing, you can start reading through Q&A, and I will answer stuff while I'm doing the drawing. I see there's some stuff up in Q&A. Uh, most of those were suggestions. Ah, all right. So folks, go ahead and start giving me some questions now. And uh, one, one of our guests said that not everyone can get to Discord, and we were reminded that the chat is saved in the recording. So Fair point. If you get a cho chance. I will admit, I haven't oh. seen the chat post uh, coming off of the attendee side very much. <laughs> so 
definitely going to be a case of, oh, hey, good to know all these things. Molly would like you to know that bats are friends. They are friends, which is why I'm doing a cute little smiling little foxy bat. And they like to hug their babies. Hug your little baby. I love the fact that baby, baby fox, baby flying foxes, a lot of baby bats will cling on to mama even when they're flying. So you'll notice something like this. I'm drawing technically upside down <laughs> because the moment I do this and she's hanging from her branch, all the proportions are going to be just a little bit off. And it will feel a little bit weird because we're used to looking at faces upright versus upside down. Quick and easy cheat. All right, time. Less than a minute, right? <laughs> We've so. got a lot of comments saying, got to flip them upside down or is this a rave? Extremely cute. God, I wish I could go straight to ink like that without a pencil first. Super <laughs> cute. It's cute, so I su fully support the bat corgi. Same, same, cute batty. All right, so since we're already screen sharing with a lot of different things, I am not going to add another screen share and show my Google screen, because that's just gonna be ridiculous. So I'm Googling flying fox, because I was definitely thinking flying foxes. I've been hanging out with too many Australians of late. I'm trying to find a pose similar to what I was just thinking of. So I'm looking for a mama and baby. And this reference image, do, 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 do. Oh, I'm actually getting from the Australian museum.net.au. So I will copy and paste that into chat if you guys want to see what I'm referencing. And now I'm not going to see chat anymore. So. Everybody be good, be kind. Remember, this is a PG channel. So I'm going to do this a little bit more sensibly now. Instead of going straight to ink, which means that I have no chance of correcting myself, I am going to start off with a lighter thing. Folks who've watched me draw before will know that I tend to draw in blue pencil because the blue pencil doesn't show up as well. And since I actually want it showing up, it means that I'm going to be doing this in a different ink, but hopefully you can see it. On that note, Morgan, can you see this okay? At least that's light, sketchy thing. Yes. Cool. Uh, Steven says, nothing wrong with the Australians. They're crazy, but that keeps things interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jonathan Sexton asks, what's a good way of finding references of animals from different angles and positions? So once your area is safely... Uh, <laughs> No longer in lockdown, please do not rush to public areas. But uh, for the moment, go ahead and you know feel free to use Google Images, but try to use things that are uh, photographs rather than renderings. If you're trying to use a reference like this, where I'm saying I want to be able to draw a real life animal, using a photograph versus another artist's eye as to what something looks like, it's gonna give you a better idea of what you're trying to come across with. I will admit what I love to do is go to a zoo or a nature center or just going out and walking in the woods. And considering the fact that phones nowadays actually have fairly good cameras, at least as far as reference images go, you know, just take your phone with you. That way you have something ready on hand that you can just photograph and it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be blurry. That's perfectly fine. The idea is to give you an idea of, okay, what's the character? What am I trying to get across? You know, the, the concept image that I wanted was I wanted mama and baby cuddling. Okay, so now it's a case of let's find mama and baby cuddling. And now I have to do things like figure out where spacing is and get a better idea. Because, you know, I, that's a pretty foxy face. Well, as far as a, hey... I'm trying to get the idea that this is a flying fox, you know, that reminds me later on, I'm looking for a flying fox image. 
and then I can come back through and do the thing I actually want. Uh, more questions? There's got to be more. Of course. Um, Pauline uh, confirms that all Aussies are indeed mad, and um, <laughs> Jonathan Sexton says that he loves the gray-headed flying foxes. Excellent choice. On note of foxy things, you might hear a corgi in the background. My corgi Basil is 100% certain that there's a chihuahua outside that can climb three floors worth of brick and she will make sure to protect us. A uh, couple questions. When you blue pencil and blue pencil, do you erase it after you have darker lines or do you just keep working over it until the picture is done? So as far as blue pencil goes, there's things like Stadler, which have a lovely, very wide blue pencil. So notice how wide this is compared to say, a more normal Prismacolor blue. Oh, there's a Prismacolor hiding in the Stadlers. Huh. So that means it's a little bit easier to hold. Um, the colored pencils don't erase quite as well, but the nice thing about them is that at least the Prismacolor Coal Erase 2004, that color was actually originally designed uh, with Kodak in mind. And a lot of animation houses would use that particular color because Xerox machines wouldn't pick it up. Even modern scanners don't do a very good job of picking it up. So if you need to just, you know, erase and, and be a little careful and have a little bit of blue left over, it doesn't get picked up very well. It's very easy to use a Photoshop type program and remove it, or you can just leave it be. Uh, to be honest, this guy here, can you see the blue pencils? I can, because I know where they are, but really, eh, I didn't erase it. It's fine. And same goes for this one. There's blue pencil in there. And once you color it, no, nope, can't see it. So for the most does part, it, I've, I've stopped erasing. <laughs> there's a question of, does it affect the, um, where the flow of the watercolor goes? So some of the blue, oh, I'm gonna flip it over because to me, eyes need to be kind of sensible. Um, some of the flow does change, but a lot of the fun with watercolor is you want it to just make its own opinions and tell you where you want it to go. So the blue pencil might adjust it a little bit, but where it does adjust it, it kind of helps the paper get some opinions. If you draw very heavily and you press hard down into the paper, then yes, it's going to adjust the watercolor, but that's because you've actually made a channel for the water to go. And uh, I wouldn't call it cheating. It's just helping the adjustments. So, okay, a few more questions have come in. How does one differentiate between inspiration and copying without losing the value of directed proportionality ooh, and framing, et cetera? Very nice question. I like it. So back to that whole, it's not copying if you reference. Uh, historically, artists would actually go into galleries and museums, and they still do, but you'd go in with your easel. You'd, of course, check beforehand to make sure the docents aren't going to, you know, kick you out for having your tools, but you'd actually go in and you'd copy the masters. And plenty of people would sell those copies, but you never sold them as originals. You would sell them as copies. This was especially a thing before computers, before the printing press. I mean, how often have you guys, actually here, raise of hands, because you guys have a raise hand button. How many of you have bought prints? How many of you have bought posters of artwork that you liked? We've got six, nine, 12, uh -huh. 13, 15. Uh -huh. So back in the day, before we had large printing presses that could reliably copy color, you would hire an artist or find an artist who had already painted you a copy of the artwork that you wanted to have in your home because you couldn't afford a couple of million dollars for the thing. And depending on how good the artist was, gave you a 
you know, different levels of copying. And traditionally taught artists like myself were taught how to copy because in the process of copying, you learned so much. You know, it's so much easier to, to learn how to paint lace if you're following along with somebody who's already painted lace. So it's more a matter of if you're going to copy, then make sure that you say, hey, this is a copy. This is my rendition of, and then be realistic. Don't go and, you know, paint a copy of the Mona Lisa and, okay, well, actually a lot of people will paint a copy of the Mona Lisa and sell it on Etsy. But, you know, if there's a small artist online and you say, ooh, I really like Archer's uh, little koala boo here. I'm going to make an exact copy of it and I'm going to sell it to the Gap and I'm going to sell it for $3,000 and and then they'll put it on t-shirts everywhere and the original artist will never get any money out of it and eh, I'm sure everybody is aware of how much this happens in the industry nowadays. It's not kind. It's not polite. It's not your work. Don't do it. But if you're trying to learn something, there's nothing wrong with copying somebody else's work, especially when you enjoy their work. I mean, I've, I've done it so many times, especially if I'm like learning a new tool. The first time I picked up Photoshop in order to try and learn how to paint with it versus you know doing digital coloring in or, or just editing photos, you better believe I pulled up some Artemisia Genaleski and went, okay, Let's see if I can copy her lace work. Let's see if I can do the thing. I couldn't, but it gave me something to focus on while I was learning how to do it and see if I could give it a try. So we have a lot of people um, talking about your art. Uh, Lizard, um, one person wants to know what the story behind Lizard John Henry is. Oh. <laughs> So I have a paladin in my favorite D&D &D group, and I'm hoping some of them are in the room because I might have invited everybody from my D&D &D group to come join. And uh, my paladin is, oh crud, uh, Dragonborn, Gold Dragonborn. And he had been uh, basically, um, don't want to say traded off, but he was raised by dwarves as a kid as part of a diplomatic, you know, uh, treaty of sorts. So basically all of his language, all of his mannerisms, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, are dwarven, even though he's about twice their height. <laughs> so, yep, he, he favors hammers and things of that nature. Okay. Going back to, um, copying uh, and fan art. Someone says they can confirm they have a high-res image of Buff Dragonborn on their other screen because <laughs> they're the DM and they can't see the lines either. Oh, that was going back to the lines. Um, ah. Lizard John Henry, Buff Dragon Boy. These are all such great titles. Um, I love it. Oh, uh, and from our, our uh, attendees, I use she, her, and your pronouns? Uh, male. I am transgender, uh, female to male, and while I'm going to try and keep the topics towards the art stuff, please, once you get back to Discord, feel free. Oh, I added an extra finger. Oh, well. uh, <laughs> I am more than happy to answer questions about transgender issues and thoughts and yada, 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 uh, just because I know that sometimes I am the first transgender person that folks meet, and I I'm an educator at heart. I'm sure a lot of folks here know that, and they like to help folks understand more. Polydactyl bat is a comment from Palace. Um, sorry, I can't see the full name. There you go, polydactyly. She's and got extra toes, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan says, oh good, everyone does the extra finger problem. Oh and my God. I would just like to, to point out that bats, um, fly through the power of jazz hands. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let's pop over to the um, Q&A. What's a good way of finding references of animals from different, a oh, angles and positions. Did we already do that one? Uh, no, not angles and positions. Oh, okay, good. Although that would be definitely falling into the find your own reference art if you can. Because if, you know, 
say you need to paint some corgis and there's no way they're going to sit in that perfect pose. That is basically a combination of a whole lot of different shots taken over the course of a week as I tried to find the right pose, the right angle, the right lighting, so that way I wouldn't have to sit and argue to try and make them perfect. I'll leave it up. They're cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we have, um, well, a suggestion for another round of art after this is perhaps, could you do a pride sand hill? So they show the grace after the flamingo stage, but they are <laughs> loud in how comfortable in themselves they are. I might do that later. I will admit because we're, you know, this is a 50 minute panel and I should be good and kind to everybody. Uh, I'm just going to be sticking to Sharpie today. So I don't want to have a pride critter that's only black and white. That's not very fun, but right. might do that later because I like the idea. Amanda would like us to know that that's our friend shaped, which is 100% true. Oh, yes. Especially if mosquitoes are not friend shaped for you. <laughs> Someone says it's Stella Luna. I don't get the reference, but I thought I would share. And um, one of our guests um, says it's even trickier when you're trying to get a triceratops into those poses. Oh, yeah. So if you have access to things like you know, 3D programs where you can just render up an animal. Cool, that makes life easier. There are more and more apps online and I can, again, endorse scored or maybe I'll post it on my website later uh, once it's no longer a landing page. How about this? I'll post things on Twitter along with Discord once I have the list together because hopefully that'll be easier. Um, bum, bum, bum. I have a few apps on my phone that let me do things like basic animal rotations and human face rotations, which definitely helps with some stuff. And yeah, when it comes to things like dinosaurs, uh, if you've seen my feeds, you've seen that I definitely draw dinosaurs and other extinct critters too. And at that point, it's if you can head to a museum and take a look at the skeletons. And the only way that that's really going to work for you is if you also study modern animals and go, okay, I see that hole on that skull. Where does that hole lead on a modern animal? All right, is that the jaw muscles? Oh, that's a really big hole. And that eye kind of went sad. Uh, Sharpies, gotta love them. Um, if you got, you know, big holes here on the cheeks, then that usually, you know, um, next to the jaw, that usually means there's a lot of muscle there. And if there's a lot of muscle there, they had a lot of chewing power, but also means that you've got plumper cheeks. And the plumper cheeks goes along with folks that do a lot of chewing and tearing and crunching. So uh, then you need to make the, the face a little bit rounder and fuller and happier. So uh, yeah, if you're going to be doing extinct animal stuff or, or uh, fantasy animals or animals that don't exist yet because they're on a different planet, then you have to study current things in order to get an idea of where you're going. Okay, I think this one is good enough for government work. So what do you think? It took a little bit longer than a minute. This one was a minute. This one, maybe like seven, ten. But got a very big idea of the differences of quick idea sketch before I forget the idea. And then, oh, hey, look, we actually finally found a reference. And you guys all have the picture, so you know what it looks like. You know that it's not exactly the way it looks on there, even though I was trying to stay fairly close. But I get the idea. I get the cuddle. I get how the wings are going. And because uh, this is, you know, maybe at the stage where I'm still drawing with the Sharpie and trying to reference it really quickly, what I'm doing is helping mark out things like where are the joints landing? Maybe that there doesn't need to be an extra toe in there and I need to be a little bit more careful with my line before I go to something like watercolor where I have even less control than with this. All right, so show of hands, next critter. I'm thinking either going mythological critter or going futuristic space critter for some alien species on a planet that we don't even know about. I don't want to go for, you know, a Star Wars or a Star Trek character. I want to go for, you know, something brand new. So, show of hands, please. Do we want to go mythical critters? And if Morgan could keep an eye on the list and tell me how many folks okay, we have. Okay, we've got two, two going mythical. Okay. All right, hands down for mythical. Are we going oh, for- Go ahead and lower them. Thank you. Okay. Are we going for a space critter, some brand new alien? Five, nine, 10, 11, 12, <laughs> 11. 
12, 11. Yeah, I, I think we're going space critter. And thank 13. you for the chance to okay. sip my tea. tea um, let's uh, pop back to the chat real quick. Uh, yeah. Alice, let me know that Stella Luna is a baby fruit bat from a kid's book with great artwork. Oh. And um, Clarissa Ryan uh, was letting us know that she hit an Alphonse Mucha exhibition that included the reference photos he took and mm -hmm. they were surprised how closely he followed his photos and his artwork and that Mucha's rush sketches were a complete mess. Yes. Yes. The idea with a rough sketch is to get the idea fast. And it's a case of what gives you, you know, what am I looking for in this? Where's my focus? I know I want a bat that is a, a flying fox versus maybe a, a traditional leaf nose bat or something from North America. So I am putting in characteristics that remind me of what I'm looking for in a reference. And I'm wanting a nice little cuddly mommy and baby. So I got the idea. I have an idea of what I'm doing. And of course I want, you know, connection here. So then I go and find a reference that is close enough to it to give me what I'm wanting. And then if I honestly, I'd probably do it three or four more times before I finally decided on the correct pose, et cetera, et cetera, before painting. All right. So show of hands again, since I was not good and I did not set up my poles. All right. So we've got an alien. So I'm thinking, you know, wait, hold for the show of hands. Let's go either desert swamp or ice critter so desert who wants a desert alien we have zero oh, oh one oh, hand one. one hand okay swampy who wants a swampy alien wait, wait let me lower oh, okay oh, oh. sorry eight we're at eight all right Six. and because i i just realized i pulled down one figure for the other and i'm not going to do that on camera uh icy who wants a nice ice alien three five Seven, eight. Ooh, oh, we're tied. We're, we're tied. Ah, swamp or ice. <laughs> now we're seven. Somebody five. I, I don't I know if they're lowering their hands or not. It's bouncing around. All right. You know what? I saw some ice swamp in in the text. Why not? Let's give it a try. That will be interesting and complicated. So. I have been handed this job by a game designer who says, hey, Archer, we need this ice swamp creature and it's going to be doing the thing. And we don't know what the thing is yet. We do not have sound design for this thing yet. Uh, we just know that the landscape is icy and swampy. So do the thing for us. And I go, oh, that, that's interesting. Okay, so let, let's go sideways instead of front ways because we're not just making the face we're making the whole body so ice creatures tend to have you know if they're water creatures oh underwater on land oh well i guess if we're on the you know gaming design maybe that's going to be more ground based because there's not much underwater games there's that one fish you know, we eat other fish but generally it's it's an on land game usually they have kind of short legs because if you have a surface area to body mass ratio, that means that you help keep your, your body heat in, then you don't have to spend quite so much energy on actually, you know, just keeping warm before doing your movement thing. If there's a tail, it's usually kind of short in ice creatures, but with swampy creatures, you often have flies of some sort bothering you. And you know what, with game design often, you want atmospheric things for the character to hear like occasional and you know fuzzy bits so maybe we're going to have a little bit of a tail maybe we'll have like some kind of hair or fin thing on the end oh that's going to be weird okay uh the audience loves the stubby little little legs excellent so swampy creatures so if it's going to be an icy swamp thing uh, maybe you don't want to fall into the water, especially if it's exceptionally cold. So maybe we're looking at actually kind of big feet for these short little legs. That's going to be interesting. Okay. Uh, probably not hooves. You're probably going to need more of a flippery thing because, well, you know, if you have a hoof, you're just going to go straight through that ice into that cold water. And, you know, if you are occasionally falling into cold water, either you're going to want really thick woolly fur with a dense undercoat, uh, or you're going to want a polar bear hair, which is hollow, 
or caribou hair, which has that hollow, uh, so it has actually little uh, bits of air inside of each hair to, to help insulate. Uh, and let's go for a bit of a short neck. Again, we're kind of keeping our, our uh, surface area to body mass good. And let's go for a big head, because, you know, we need some character in this game design, character that we're making. All right, oh, and I'm stumped now. So this is when I'd reach out back to our game design group. And you guys are my game design by committee, which is actually pretty close to the real thing. Uh, are we going carnivore or herbivore? I'm gonna leave omnivore out of the picture for now. So just com carnivore or, or, om or herbivore. So are we eating meat? Raise hands if we're eating meat. One, two, two five. five, six, seven. All right. Seven. Seven for, for eating meat. All right. Are we doing a plant eater? Eight. Oh, all right. Plant eater it is. So we might need to break through some of the ice because we might have more aquatic plants underneath the ice. So I'm going to go back to my memory of things like, you know, um, mammoths and, and other pachyderms that were in our ice ages. If you want really fun ones though, we actually, there was a pachyderm that had a long lower jaw, if I remember correctly, and it had a huge hole here in its skull, which means that it actually had a fairly well-formed snout. So that lower jaw with its teeth did nice shoveling motion and then it had a fairly short trunk because, again, that surface area on its body is a big issue. Got to be careful. And then would have had a short trunk that would have helped bring things in. So it might not have needed really big tusks on the top. These might have been more for display purposes, while this one would have been our heavy worker. So uh, probably going mammal. If it was a mama and baby, you know, then you can look up certain data about that with elephants and things nowadays, because apparently now I'm thinking elephant with duck feet. Uh, probably going to be fairly small eyes, because again, we don't want uh, too much cold in there. Eye membranes are pretty delicate, but we're probably going to have really long eyelashes. And that probably won't get designed in the game design, but hey, that's what concept sketches are for. Uh, long eyelashes. Uh, again, you're capturing icicles, you're keeping the eyes protected, tiny ears, because you're, again, not going to want too much loss of heat in there. Actually, I'm going to go a little smaller. That's kind of looking human, that's okay. And you know what, I am going to go a little bit more on the woolly side. Let's say that we've got a lot of kind of fluffy hair around the neck and it gets shorter down the body. And when I'm starting thinking about things like that, I'm thinking about the fact of, oh, hey, if you've got a uh, herbivore this big, then you might very well have a carnivore that's even bigger. How would you protect yourself while you're dealing with things like that? And really tough hair around the neck area where you're sensitive and maybe some bristles around the spine area because you might have some stalking predators that come up and try to grab onto the butt. Because if this area has big old teeth that can protect you, you want to grab onto this end in order to get your meal. So very strange concept cool we've got our idea has it been approved by committee can we get some hands yes no yes please six hey. seven eight nine, 12. beautiful 15. awesome all right committee has approved this sketch again in real life if i was taking this through a real committee we'd probably have 10 or 20 or 30 different ones that's okay for right now this is what we're going with i'm going to get a sip of my drink while morgan Wait. starts looking at the q a We've got some questions about, do you have a preferred paper for ink and for watercolor? Uh, <laughs> any more hints for selecting references of real creatures to make mythical creatures? And what apps do you have? So apps I will list in Discord and on Twitter later today. So that will be easier. If you're trying to find me, Bluestone Archer at art has a landing page because I broke my website this morning. Uh, <laughs> But basically, I'm Bluestone Archer everywhere, just for ease of finding me. So that will give you an idea of where I am, and I'll try to post all the things later. And as far as right now, honestly, I'm using Google Images at the moment because I'm not going outside. If I was looking at uh, elephant anatomy as a starting place, then I would go to the local zoo at the Smithsonian because we have I, 
an hour away by public transit, I can actually get to a place where I can see elephants and I could sit and study them all day long if I want to. But I'm not leaving my house right now. <laughs> there was some suggestion that we were reinventing the walrus or maybe a land walrus, but with it becoming more mammoth-like, it's now maybe a mammoth or a wall moth. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> so I am looking for a gomphamir, if I remember correctly, as far as this guy goes. And again, I am blessed that I have the Smithsonian so close to me, which means that I am used to going and studying fossils on the regular, uh, you know, because I'm a weird artist like that. Uh, the question is, how do did, I spell it? Did you have an answer for the paper question, preferred ah, paper? Paper question. So, oh, um, when you're first starting out, my first suggestion is use cheap paper. And the reason why I would say that is that you'll notice, I mean, okay, I'm using cardstock because I don't want the Sharpie to go through and hit my desk. Uh, <laughs> but really, when you're first starting off, you want to use something that is not precious to you because you need to practice and practice and practice and just go through more and more and more uh, iterations of things before you're comfortable. Uh, the whole 10,000 hours thing, you just, you need to get time in before uh here we go found you come here my beautiful gum from here which i have no idea how to pronounce so copying pasting into the chat so you guys can see the strange creature come on you paste oh my control button has disappeared all right so i'll start off with that as my starting place and I'm going for the second image on that Wikipedia entry so you can see exactly where I am starting off with. Anyway, so back to paper. Um, go cheap to begin with, but occasionally treat yourself to something nice. And the reason why I say that is that some papers act very, very differently. And if you get too used to... Um, having to deal with all the cheap stuff. I mean, if I applied watercolor to this right now, it would bleed right through, it would go everywhere, it would be an absolute mess, and not in the pretty way that watercolor can be. Uh, yeah, the good paper will treat you very, very differently. Uh, I will recommend Plaza Art. Uh, it's a local art shop. Uh, they have a couple different locations in the D.C. area. If you get over, I think it's like $65, they do free shipping or they have a uh, pickup at the door if you need to. And you can get water paper by the page. And so you can actually try out different things. Uh, different papers will act differently and what you do style-wise will, will need different things than what I do. So it's gonna be a case of basically try it and see what you like, see what works for you. And if something doesn't work, don't say, oh, well, I'm a terrible artist because this was terrible. Say, well, that didn't work for me. I know to avoid it now. <laughs> Just move on and try something else. Uh, I have seen painters use all sorts of things. You don't even have to use water. Uh, sorry, you don't have to use, no. yes, you don't have to use water. There's acrylic, there's gouache, there's watercolor. There's tempera paint, there's finger paint, uh, oil-based paint. You can even make your own pigments if you're insane like I am. Uh, just play around. That's kind of the fun of having fun like this, is that you need to try different things and see what works for you. Mark Mark yes, uh, I'm sorry. I was, I was about to... Um... <laughs> I don't know if you address which apps you use. Oh, uh, apps I'll post. Oh, right, right. Okay. I'm, I'm not pulling up my phone to find all my apps. I'd rather focus on you guys and, and focus on what drawings that we are making okay. by committee. <laughs> and for people who aren't on Discord, he'll be putting it on his Twitter as well. So you, that doesn't require a login to, to view. So that should be um, accessible for everyone with an internet connection, which you all have because you're here. And you'll notice back to the reference images I just sent through Wikipedia, the second image, which is the one I'm mostly using at the moment, 
doesn't nicely show the lower jaw. I'm not quite sure why, probably because it's a different fossil entirely than the one I intended to use. The first one has the long jaw. I'm going to utilize the long jaw with that and add it to the next one down the line. It's fine. <laughs> Someone right. asked about the folk art ultra dyes. Folk art ultra dyes. Oh, um, I've not got a chance to play with those yet. I think those are on my list uh, and note of lists of things. Uh, pretty soon I'm going to actually be doing a whole bunch of videos on testing out different inks and other things because I've had, I. I have so many different ways of, of doing inking for my watercolors. And I realized that I have over 60 different types of black, <laughs> just black, not even going into the other colors. And that, uh, you know, everyone has different, you know, it, it works with different inks and, and different paints and different markers. So I will be posting test runs of those uh, on to Twitter and YouTube, and you guys can see that if you want to follow me and, and find out how they work. And that might end up being on my list of, of things I need to try, because like many artists, I often find a single thing that works for me. And for me, my favorite brushes, as far as traditional brushes, ha ha ha, go. These guys, Tombow pens, that has become my go-to. If I don't want to think about it, actually, that's what made this one. I'll trade images. Uh, my Tombow brushes are amazing. It's a brush pen, but then I don't have to dip my, my brush into ink constantly because it's a pen. I just put the cap on it. I move on with my life. And uh, it's water uh, stable and, ink and uh, alcohol stable. So I can use Coptic markers to color or I can uh, color it with watercolor if I want to. So these have turned into my everything, but the thing is, is that they can't do all of the things. And if I only used that thing, I would start editing myself and making my art fit that one brush versus finding out all the other tools, which is why I've decided that my, my next art challenge to myself is try all of my things and document it. Because if I don't document it, if I don't write down, hey, this is good for this and this is good for that, I'm not gonna remember. And so the next time art by committee comes up and tells me, hey, I need blah. I'm mean, going to think, aha, I can do it because I've tested it and I know how to go back to it and find out what it is. Or I'm going to go, I have no clue here. This is an artist that I know that's done it before. Maybe ask them. <laughs> that's, a, <clears throat> that's a very scientific approach for an artist. <laughs> I hang out with too many scientists. Do, do you use spreadsheets? Oh, yeah. Do you have um, one of those artists um, wrist holsters for switching pens? Uh, that would probably be smart. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those, uh, I, I should take better care of my equipment. All of these are sitting in a metal cup. Some of them are sitting upright. They might be able, they might need to be sitting upside down instead. I know that some of them will leak if I'm storing them upside down, but with the brush pens typically because ink stays in them, you actually want the bristles to stay damp. So about once a week, I turn everybody upside down, let them sit for a little bit and turn them right side up again. Take care of your equipment, especially if you spend a lot of money on it, cough, cough, because you don't want to be relying on something and then finding out halfway through a thing that, oh no, I it, it's broken. Uh. <laughs> and the puppies are kind to your equipment? Uh, my puppies are short. <laughs> Which makes it easier. I will admit I have definitely found things chewed up and if you tend to favor things that will not get washed away by watercolor paint, uh, it does mean that uh, it's harder to wash out. So, mm, <laughs> gotta be a little careful. And I'm sure you guys, if you're following along with the link I sent for the uh, Wikipedia article, you'll noticing that I'm making the legs much, much shorter because I, again, am trying to make a short squat critter. And right now I'm basically just sketching in a very rough idea of what the skeleton looks like. So that way I have something to follow along with and keep so my proportions. I have some bad news. We're hitting time. Oh, Any man. final questions? Oh, yeah, we really are hitting time. Duck feet. Yeah, you know what? 
Writing time, deadline's coming up. Programmers need to program. Let's do this thing. But yes, please ask questions. Uh, so far we had, there's no such thing as too many scientists. Uh, thanks, it was really great. Ha ha, speed run. Um, no additional questions have come pouring in. One person has their hand raised. Oh, what do you think, Morgan? I'm leaving it to you. My hands are too busy. I've got that deadline. Sarah would like to know, uh, would you use multiple references for the same drawing? If so, how would you split it up? Whoa. So if I had had a little bit more time and was better with my time management, uh -huh. uh, small, short tongue for cold air animals, please. What I would often do is actually spend a lot of time doing exactly what I'm doing now, where I basically do this level of sketching over and over again, but for different reference images. And every time I'm doing one of these, what I'm doing is I'm actually training my subconscious into thinking about what this animal is, where it's like connective tissues are like again you know there, there's probably going to be big chewing muscles here and you know tiny head is hey we don't need a brain we're in an ice swamp it's fine um <laughs> and as you choose different angles you know front on back on its side things of that nature your brain is going to start learning how this creature moves and thinks and does everything that it needs to do and then when you need to go and draw things from whole cloth, you will have had trained yourself, even if this isn't a real animal. Very squat legs. Maybe having Kind some... of has a vulture-esque neck. Yeah. With the rough. I think I saw some vulture earlier in the chat, so I started thinking <laughs> about it. And again, I'm sorry for the duck feet, but... I didn't pull up a reference on Duck Feet because I wasn't looking at the time. So we're uh, going back to this style of foot <laughs> to give myself an idea of where the feet are going. Come on, folks. I thought you guys were going to tease me and make this hard. I, I think they're, they're letting you race because you have, I think, one more minute before we really should should wrap. Oh, I can race and chat. Keep going. Go for Nothing it. Nothing to tease. It's fantastic. Um, uh, from Baden, Robert believes you need to put some gold leaf on it. That is not going to be doable in a minute worth of time. My apologies. <laughs> Maybe once we get into the final renders and we need some hero shots in order to help sell this crazy video game that you guys have come up with for me. Maybe I'll do some box art if you pay me enough. How about that? Gina is working on her own their own project at the same time. Richard would like to know how long you've been working professionally. And Sarah would like you to know, oh man, it's so cute. <laughs> um, so I've been doing the art thing for probably about 30 years. Uh, that does not mean that it's always been a professional level of art, but I've been doing the art thing for a very long time. Um, I've only I guess if you want to call it a professional artist, I guess that's only been for a couple of months because I actually taught art at uh, a, a local place to here. And yeah, I guess I could say I was a professional artist for that. As far as like selling art, I've been doing the Balticon art show for a few years now. <laughs> the chat is debating about a good name for it, um, Walmoth, but we've got Vulture too, so maybe Vulwalmoth or Muskeg Thrumper. Uh, Richard would like to uh, let everyone know that teaching is a profession. Oh, it definitely is. I'm just saying I was not a professional artist until I started teaching art professionally, I don't think. At least it's, it's hard to have that on the resume as professional artist without having, you know, professional level things. <laughs> Well, we are at um, six minutes over at this oh, point. Goodness. Well, I'd say that this is good enough for government work. It's enough of a concept to say to the game designers, hey, do you like it? Where do we go from here? How, how do we want to uh, explore this concept further? And honestly, as far as starting ideas, you know, it's a starting place. That's OK. Hopefully it got the idea across. And thank you all for joining us. 
Uh, again, bluestoneorchard.art for my uh, terrible landing page because I broke my website. Discord.gg at Baltimore Sci-Fi for our lovely Discord and Bluestone Archer at Twitter and various other things. And I will put links up for all of the references. I'm probably not going to scan these, but I'll photograph them and put them online so folks can see what they are. And since this was recorded, uh, missing the beginning, that's okay. But since this is recorded, it will uh, go up on Twitch and maybe YouTube tonight. Uh, I don't remember which. It's been a long weekend. Thank you for joining it, us. <laughs> it'll go up on YouTube as soon as the closed captioning is updated to be better than automated. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, I'm going to be over on the Discord and answering questions, comments, concerns, yada, yada, yada. There is an after panels discussion section and Bluestone Archer under, oh, goodness, I covered the thing. Blue Stone Archer, under uh, the B-54 Artist Scout Alley section in uh, our Discord as well. So I will probably be in both spots. I will admit I'm going to be running another panel tech-wise soon. So you might, I might be radio silent for, you know, a half hour, but then I'll be back again. Thank you all for joining again and have a lovely weekend. And thank you for joining us at Balticon.